I was real careful this year. In previous years, I've just about lost my voice, so I had to uh, quench the spirit a little bit in my singing and, you know, hold back a little bit or I wouldn't be able to talk. But uh, it is such a blessing. You know, um, just the experience of being able to sing like that and to put yourself in mind's eye, what it, just a little, probably a small, small fragment of what it might be when we are all finally around the throne. The myriads and myriads of angels, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands stood before him and the judgment was set and the books were open. And John, whenever he's there and he hears all these these myriads of voices and they say blessing and honor and power and glory and majesty might be unto him that liveth forever and ever. And you think about maybe us being able to be in that chorus. That's going to be something, isn't it? It's going to be crazy. And uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate being able to be here and just to be able to experience some of that. I, I love it. And it's, it's fed my spirit. You know you grow in all kinds of ways. You grow intellectually as you study some things in Scripture. But you also grow in your spirit as you get to sing and have experiences. Now... Salvation and fellowship is not all about experience, but that's a big part of it. And you ought to feel something. And if you've been here all week and you haven't felt nothing yet, then something's wrong. Tell you one thing, talk about being thankful. I was thankful um, that they have rails back there. Because these guys running around, man, they would have fallen off. <laughs> like, praise the Lord for, for boundaries. It's been a privilege to be able to preach to you. I really appreciate you being very attentive. And uh, these, these other guys did a phenomenal job. You didn't even need me here. I don't know that I've contributed much. But I really, I really hope that you got a blessing out of this. And we got one more message today. From the book of Nehemiah, let's start in chapter number 13. Nehemiah chapter number 13. We'll finish it up. We dealt with the condition of your place, the ruin in need of repair. We moved to the construction of your place, rebuilding from the ground up. We talked about the conflict over your place where you have to rely on God's help. The consecration of your place where you rejoice because of God's victory. And today we're going to talk about conserving your place. You must constantly revive that place of fellowship. All right, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse number 1. On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass, when they had heard the law, that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. And before this, Eliashib the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a great chamber where aforetime they laid the meat offerings, the frankincense and the vessels and the tithes of the corn, the new wine and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and the porters and the offerings of the priests. But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem. For in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king. And after certain days obtained I leave of the king. And I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers, and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field. Then contended I with the rulers and said, 
Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Brother Stevenson, you've been a blessing, brother. Will you pray and ask the Lord to bless the message for us? Amen. Thank you so much. You'll notice in verse number 6 that Nehemiah had went back for a while and he's gone back to which the scripture for some reason designates it Babylon. The Persian Empire took over Babylon. There's probably some hints of prophecy in those connections with Persian Babylon. But nonetheless, Nehemiah goes back. Remember, he was the cupbearer. So he goes back and then some things take place when Nehemiah is not there. And he comes back and finds all this stuff going on where basically old Tobiah has showed up again and because of those connections he had way back, he kind of married into the family. People begin to let him come in and they had actually sent the Levites out. They've done fled. They're out there working in the fields. They're supposed to live with the things of the temple. They've forsaken the house of God and Tobiah's got his own little apartment in there. Nehemiah comes back and sees this apostasy. Now for us, the application is pretty simple, I think. Uh, I believe we've made some headway, I hope, in our personal lives with getting some rubbish out, building some walls of protection, maybe even consecrating some things in our personal life to God. But as they've already talked about, you're going to come down off this mountain and some time is going to take place. And the fellowship that you have in that place that God wants in your life, you have to conserve that place. Now, I'm not talking about conserving your salvation. You cannot keep your salvation. You couldn't earn your salvation, and you can't keep your salvation. We're talking about fellowship. Salvation's up to Him, but you know, fellowship's up to you. And it's up to us to conserve what God's done. Man, you're singing like this. There's no way. And you notice how singing gets better as the week goes on? That's because all the rubbish gets pushed out. We didn't throw Tobias down there at the bottom of the hill. You know, we didn't kick him out. He's down there holding up a cardboard sign. You're going to see him on the way home. You know, homeless. Can I get a ride? Don't pick him up on the way home. Don't even have mercy on him. Throw him a chick track. Throw him a chick track and keep on riding. Run him over. <laughs> Run him over. <laughs> Take your tag off your vehicle before you do that. <laughs> so when he goes back, you'll notice that there's an unholy compromise that has led the people, verses 1 through 9, to become command breakers, verses 1 through 9, 10 to 14, house of God forsakers, Verses 15 to 22, money makers. You know, they're out there working on the Sabbath day, trying to do the things they need to do. And then the end of the chapter, children's spoilers. Their kids are all messed up. You got to look out, I'm telling you, because entropy happens. And the laws of thermodynamics, everything breaks down. I think Dr. Upman made a statement that um, you have to... uh, uh, the Word of God is, is like that fuel injection, and you have to inject that into your depraved nature because you will go down, not up. You will wear out. Your fellowship tends to decrease. Yes. 
And so there's some steps here in the passage I think that can help us. There was a large corporation that fell. And different business analysts, they made their evaluation of why this huge corporation fell. And one particular analyst said this. He said, the company, it was, they did not fall because the vision was flawed. He said, their execution was. You might know all these things, but unless you put them into practice, it happened in Bible times, it will happen in your life. You have to conserve your place. So let's look at it and see. Number one, back up to chapter 12. Some things take place toward the end of chapter 12 where they dedicated the walls back in 27, verse number 27. And so I believe that you've got to look back sometimes and you've got to remember, number one will be this, remember the dedication. Remember the dedication. Uh, 27, 28, you look at that, they dedicated the walls, they came in with gladness, with thanksgiving, verse 27, with singing, with psalteries, with harps, the sons of the singers gathered together, and they're, they're basically standing in their place at their section on the actual wall. They're on top of that thing, and they're looking at what God did. Now, first of all, it's their contribution. They look back at the dedication, the contribution, what they gave to God. Now, if you've done business with God this week, you have brought some things down to this altar. You've cried some tears. You've come and you've contributed some hard work in getting that rubbish out and laying some foundation and, and building those walls. But it's not just that. It's compensation. They're standing on that wall and they're looking not just what they did, but what God did through them. God gave them a wall. You know what? God gave you a wall this week. God's made some things real. It's amazing how clear the Lord will be, and it's amazing how clear the Bible can be when you separate from all the junk. And you've got these little gray areas like, well, I wonder if this is really bad. And I wonder if that's really bad. Once you get away for a while and you get in this book, it becomes crystal clear. And God builds that wall and it's there. You can see it. They're standing on it. You know, uh, you can look back this week. I know they're sending these pictures around. Everybody's taking pictures. You do that on your phone. You have this thing. Your phone, I think mine does it, where it brings up things from a year or two ago, you know. And it'll even make these little movies for you, you know. And you, then you kind of had forgotten, and then you look at all these pictures, and as soon as you see the pictures, and some of them are video clips, and some of them are pictures, and you're emotionally, you start to relive all that. God gives us leftovers. Remember the feeding of the 5,000? They took up the baskets. And God's done some things for you this week. You've built some walls. You've drug out some rubbish. And maybe you've made some personal decisions. And, and you need to look back over those things and remember the dedication. There's been too much work, too much sweat, too much of God dealing with you this week to let it all go. Amen. It's too big a deal what you did this week to give it all up. You must conserve it. You must hang on to it. You must revisit it. Look back over what you did for God and what God did for you. Remember the dedication. But notice chapter 13, number 2, when you get back, if you're going to conserve your place, you're going to have to remove the deceivers. You've got to remove the deceivers. Now... We kind of pretty much booted them out up here, you know. We don't have to worry about it. It's a blessing this year having just our church group here, wasn't it? I walked down late one night, and I could hear across the road there, you know, where that other camp is? And they're jamming out just like they always did. And I was like, thank God we're not over there. You know, thank God we had our own group. We got to push everybody out. But you know what's going to happen when you get down the mountain? You're going to hear the junk again. Number one, you've got to have detection. Detection. Verses 1 through 3, there's groups here. 
You'll notice these groups that were not allowed in the congregation. You say, what does that mean? That means God is very exclusive. So what does that mean? That means God discriminates. You either take Jesus Christ or you get out of here. I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm just saying. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You either receive Him or you reject Him. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. The tears were shed at Calvary. You go to Calvary to get the love of God or you're not going to get the love of God. Don't mistake God's long-suffering and mercy for His love because if you're not saved and those that aren't saved, they are under the wrath of God. And it's just the thread of mercy that's preserving their life and them dropping off into hell. Now you better realize, some of you, you get these connections and these friends and then you realize after a while, you know, they're all letters of the alphabet. L-G-B-T-Q-S-Y-Z. And, well, they're just so nice, you know, and very kind. And they're wicked. They're wicked. They're wicked and ungodly. You better detect it. Certain groups. Notice verse number four, individuals. Here's Tobiah again. Tobiah in the... The book of Nehemiah is a type of the Antichrist. You say, why? Because what he does is, is he goes into the temple, into the holy place. So he goes into that place like the Antichrist will declare himself to be God one day. Now let's translate that into our life. You have a situation to where that Tobiah, whatever you let it to be or allow it to be, you begin to let him back in. You kicked him out when you built the wall. You put up the gates and you locked the gates and you got him out, but you kept a little bit of a connection. You didn't delete that one phone number. You didn't delete that one contact. You kept that one connection. Now look, please don't misunderstand me. You've got to rub shoulders with people that you work with. Some of you have to go to school and God forbid you've got to go to public school. God give you help and strength, but you've got to rub shoulders with that. Sometimes people out in the world, you got to rub shoulders. Jesus said, I pray that thou wouldst take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil. You can't just go in a monastery somewhere, you know, dig a hole, stick your head in the sand. But you've got to be real careful not to allow the Tobias to rub off on you. You keep that connection. And you better be careful. There's an individual. So we have detection, number one. And then we have disconnection, number two. Verses three through nine. It's really clear what takes place here. Verse number seven, when Nehemiah comes and he realizes what's going on. Verse number eight, it grieved him sore. Therefore, I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded and they cleansed the chambers thither. Nehemiah goes in and he cast out. He gets the stuff out of there. And you're going to have to make up your mind. If you're going to conserve your place, you're going to have to remove the deceivers, groups and individuals. Say, preacher, that's just so mean. That's just so hard. Let me ask you this. Does Jesus Christ have the preeminent place? If He has the preeminent place, you can't allow Tobiah to be there. Not even on an equal level. Tobiah just edges him way in there. And I tell you, the devil is very subtle. And he'll take those necessary connections. And he'll try to use those necessary connections to wedge his way in there. To get you to compromise. Number one, remember the dedication. Number two, remove the deceivers. Remove the deceivers. Nehemiah didn't think twice about it. And you don't need to think twice about it. Number three, this will be really the last one, and we'll park here just for a little bit. Number three, if you want to conserve your place, you're going to have to revive your devotion. You're going to have to revive your devotion. See, it's not not all negative. Remember I told you way back in the first sermon, repentance from and repentance to. 
So here's the idea. The idea is you, if you can be filled with the Spirit, just like you take a cup and you pour water in it, if there was anything in there, the more water you pour in there, it's going to push the bad stuff out. It's going to overflow. So the idea is to revive that which is good, to revive your devotion to Jesus Christ. That will help you to be able to remove the deceivers. But if you just go in and you try to get rid of all the bad without filling up with that which is good, you're not going to make it. Moses died on the mountaintop because he got closer and closer and closer to God. His face just shined. His natural force, his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Some of you, you're just so infatuated with the flesh and so consumed with even your sins, and so consumed with the Tobias in your life, all you think about is Tobiah. All you think about is Tobiah down there at the bottom, and you know he's going to hitchhike, you know he's got his little sign, and you know he's going to jump in, and all you can think about him, you can't even look at the road, you're just looking for Tobiah. You need to get your mind off of Tobiah. Yeah, you're going to have to deal with him, but the Bible does not say looking unto our sin and looking unto our problems and looking unto our flesh. The Bible says looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You better turn your eyes upon Jesus. If you get Jesus Christ in that holy place, he'll take care of Tobiah for you. He'll kick him out. Jesus Christ, man, is like Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a type of Christ here, man. Jesus goes in there. There's two times he drives the uh, money changers out of the temple, the beginning of his ministry and the end of his ministry. And, boy, he goes in there and he's mad. Righteous indignation. Don't let the world fool you into thinking when you get mad at sin and sinners that something's wrong with you. No, something's right with you. You know, you see a bear coming at you, you know, and he's growling and everything. You should, you know, really take that seriously. You don't say, well, you know what? I want to be tolerant and I want to be inclusive and I want to allow, he can use my bathroom if he wants to because, hey, you know, men, women, it, bears, whatever. That's the first time I'm, you know, I'm isolated, man. That's the first time I saw a sign that had that, those three things there. Yeah. Like you need to put, you know, in the middle one, you need to write it. Yeah. It's crazy, man. But the idea is, when you see sin for what it is, and you see sinners for what you are, God gave you some common sense, and God gave you the Holy Spirit, and you need to call it what it is. Sin ought to bother you. And if you love Jesus Christ, you will not want to buy a anywhere close to that special place. You won't let Him in. But you've got to revive that devotion. Like I told you, the old black preacher said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind. Because if you can do that, everything else will take you. Be, if you're busy with that, you won't have time for nothing else. Revive your devotion. Let's look at a few things. Number one, purification. Purification. Verse number 9. Purification. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers. And thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. Purification. In Revelation chapter 2, he says, You need to remember from whence thou art fallen and repent. He talks about leaving your first love. You remember, you repent, and you return. There's a purification process. Jesus said, now you are clean through the word which I have given unto you. There's a purification process. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for cleansing. Thank God for purification. Let me give you this from Susanna Wesley. And of course, she raised all those children. Of course, two great preachers and that shook the world. Jonathan, I mean, uh, John and Charles Wesley. She said this about sin. Whatever weakens your reasoning, 
impairs that tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes away your relish for spiritual things. If anything increases the can't read. If anything increases the authority and power of the flesh over the spirit, to you that is sin. No matter how good it is in itself. Let me, let me hit, it, hit it again. Whatever weakens your reasoning, impairs that tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes away your relish for spiritual things. If anything increases the authority and power of flesh over the Spirit, to you that is sin. No matter how good it is in itself. So when we talk about purification and we talk about consecration, this is a whole lot deeper than just, I don't chew and I don't smoke and I don't dip and I don't go with those that do. When I spit, it's white. <laughs> it's a whole lot deeper than that. It has to do with your thought life. It has to do with your heart. It has to do with your attitude. It has to do with that holy place down in there where Jesus is supposed to have the preeminence. Do you find yourself not being as tender to the Holy Spirit? Do you find yourself where your conscience isn't bothered as much by sin as it used to be? Have you ever been in a restaurant and you sit down, you're looking at the menu and everything, and, and as you sit there, you just, after a while, you notice it's gotten darker. And at a certain time of the day, they'll normally, in some of these restaurants, they'll dim, start dimming the lights. But if you dim the lights real slowly, a lot of times you can't tell it. Yeah. And what happens in your Christian life when you allow Tobias and you allow these Ammonites and these people that have no business being in your holy place, when you allow just a little bit of that, you just kind of accept it. And you develop, on the inside, you develop this hardness around that to where you try to be receptive to the Holy Spirit in some areas, but that one little place you've kind of just kept for yourself. You've got your little Tobiah in there, and you build him a little chamber. You've got his own little special place. He's got his little door. And you shut him when you come to camp, and you kind of keep him locked in there when you're at camp. You don't want anybody to know, you know, you got Tobiah hid out here, you know. And as soon as you get down, you know, you open the door and you let him back out. I'm telling you, you need to get him out here and, and let him... Push him down that mountain. Yes. Amen. Purification. You better revive the devotion. The next thing here is prioritization. Prioritization. Really, verses 10 through 22. Prioritization. What happened was everybody had gotten out of sorts. And it didn't happen overnight. There's a few years that Nehemiah is gone and things just begin to crumble. And the Levites now, verse number 10, they're gone out there working in the field. They're supposed to be taken care of by the tithes and things. And the house of God's been forsaken. The tithes, um, all that, Tobiah's actually taken some of that stuff. Then verse number 15, you have folks in Judah treading the wine presses on the Sabbath day. They're out there trying to make money on the Sabbath, which according to Old Testament law, the Sabbath, which is Saturday, that's the Jewish holy day. They're not supposed to do any work like that. They're supposed to rest and allow their animals to rest and give that day to God. And they're going out working, verse number 16, they're selling goods on the Sabbath day. The nobles and the leaders are actually promoting this, verse number 17. So you got to prioritize some things. you got to prioritize your time when you get back. Because if you don't, Tobiah is going to take that from you. Amen. You've had some time maybe here where you've memorized some verses. Maybe you've had some time in the morning you've taken. You know what? You better go ahead and write it on your schedule. Yeah. Those who fail to plan, plan to fail. You've got to prioritize. Prioritize your time. Uh, prioritize, just go down to the T's. You can come up with your own. Your talents. God's given you some abilities. You need to give those abilities to God and work on those things. 
your treasures and your tithe. You see all that here in the text. I'm going to give you something here. This is called, uh, a lot of people get this, especially down south where I'm at. It's called uh, Sunday-itis. It's also known as Morbus Sabbaticus. Morbus Sabbaticus. This baffling condition produces symptoms that are only seen on Sunday. It produces acute laziness in the person afflicted. It causes them to sleep in, or it can make them spend the day in the mountains or at the lake. This strange disease never seems to affect singing or eating meetings, you know, when you have dinner on the grounds and things, but only those services where the Word of God is preached. Symptoms usually are worse between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. During the afternoon, the sufferer feels better until about 5 or 6 p.m. when the symptoms return. The patient is almost always better by Monday morning, allowing him to return to work. But sadly, he usually suffers a relapse on Wednesday that keeps him away from prayer meeting. <laughs> Sundayitis. Here's another one. It's called cirrhosis of the giver. Cirrhosis of the giver. This all too common affliction produces severe tenderness in the area immediately around the wallet and the checkbook. It causes a sufferer to feel compelled to give as little as possible to the Lord and His kingdom's ministry. These Jews, they had gotten everything out of priority. Your priority is not to have a great career. As I look at young people, it's a big deal what you choose to do in your career. It's a big deal who you choose to marry. But your number one priority is not relationships on this earth. Your number one priority is not so many figures in a salary. Your number one priority is not a picture-perfect home with a little house and the family and the picket fence. Your number one priority is the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to prioritize. If you're going to revive your devotion, you have to go back sometimes and look back over and see where your investments... You know, I don't know all the legal terms, but they encourage people with their investments and things that they have to review their portfolios and to make sure they are diversified and have things in certain areas so all your eggs aren't in one basket as they claim and all this kind of stuff. You know what people do? They will spend more energy and effort over material prosperity than Bible believers will over their spiritual prosperity. And you wonder why you're a mess... And you wonder why you don't have fellowship with God. You've got to prioritize. You're too busy not to make time for your special time between you and Jesus. And by the way, it's quality, not quantity. If you can only read one verse, but God gets in you with that verse, and you get in the Word of God with that verse, bless God, just read one verse a day. But you feed off of the Word of God and grow in your relationship. You've got to revive that devotion. William Booth tried to encourage some of them. He's the founder of the Salvation Army. Now it's just a humanitarian organization. But years ago, it was a soul-saving station. And he would train people to go out. He was a very eccentric man. He looked like a, in his old life, man. You look, see old pictures, it looks like a wizard, man. That guy looks spooky. <laughs> Long beard, man. He looked, he looked weird. Uh, but he, he had a touch of God on his life. And he passed that burden on, or tried to pass that burden on to others. And he would tell his workers, he said, it's the nature of a fire to go out. You've got to remove the ashes. You've got to keep the fire fed. And you've got to keep the fire stirred. I noticed we're giving testimonies there. They kept throwing a little fuel on the fire. It started getting a little bit dark and a little bit cool, so the guys would get down there and throw a little fuel on the fire. you got to put some fuel on the fire. You can't just live off summer camp all year. You can't just go to church you know, every now and again or, or tune in, listen every now and again. 
You've got to feed the new man. Amen. You've got to feed the fire. You've got to stir it up. Are you stirred up or are you stagnant? Yeah. You might be stirred up now, but when you get out there, what will happen is, down where I'm from, we got gators, amen. amen. Pastor Gene, he's seen some. Amen. Man, we got them. We got gators, and you know a lot of that, those uh, lands like where we duck hunt and stuff, there's a certain type of food that those ducks like to eat. And you'll notice you think it's grass. You'll drive by and you think, what's well, looks like some kind of prairie out there? It's not grass. It's, it's green and it's still, but there's this stagnation, all this algae growth on top of the water. It's water. But you couldn't tell it because it's just so still, it's grown stagnant. And unless you stir it up, it's not going to flow. You've got to revive your devotion. Purification, one. Prioritization, two. Finally, 23 to 31, protection. 23 to 31. Now, verse number 23, he sees some Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and Ammon and Moab. Their children spake half the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them must forgive Nehemiah, and curse them. <laughs> now don't you go out and start cursing out your neighbors. The Bible says curse you, you know. Oh, no. Lorenzo Dow, you know, pronounce a curse on the place. You ever heard of Lorenzo Dow? You all know who I'm talking about? The guy in East Georgia? Well, he was a preacher, a street preacher. They took him and they beat him. You know who I'm talking about, Randy. You know, I think I do remember this. Yeah, well, they took this guy. He, he would go to these towns. He was eccentric. He was, you know... Kind of a little bit, you know, how everybody who's a Bible believer is normally weird in some way. But he would go and preach hell, fire, and damnation. And when these towns, I think he was Methodist or maybe he was nothing. But he would preach, and when a town would refuse him, he would just get out there and dust off his feet. Well, he came to this little town in East Georgia, and he preached there, and they took him and they beat him up. I mean, they pulverized him, beat him up. And there was one little family there that took him back to their house, and they nursed his wounds up. And he got up in the next day and he cursed the town and left. Wasn't too long after that, they started having some floods. And the floods literally washed that whole town away. So you believe that? I preached over in East Georgia and the preacher took me to see that place. And there is a plaque outside of the house. The only place left standing was the place where they took the man in and took care of him. That, you go out there and that's a spooky feeling, man. East Georgia, I preached in a couple of different places over there. Maybe three or four different places in East Georgia. That, has a, that whole area has a weird... Anybody ever been to Savannah, Georgia? The place has got a weird spirit. John Wesley, he said Savannah was wicked, man. One of the most wicked cities he ever preached in. And uh, he set up churches in Savannah and stuff. But that East Georgia, man, there's a spirit to that place. But this is not saying you need to go out and try to you know, curse everybody don't get saved. No, don't do that. But Nehemiah, man, he was tough. And he went out and he was going to protect his place. Now notice, there's the gates of your place, personally. You better have some grit and some determination to protect what God has built this week. The Lord's done some things specially for you this week. And you better protect that. But not just the gates of your place, but the gates of your posterity. Verses 24, 25. Here's these children. They don't even speak the Jews' language anymore. You know, they're just talking like the world, you know. Whatever the world's lingo is, they've picked on it. Now they're doing all the texting language and all the other stuff or whatever. You know, I was amazed... I guess I shouldn't have been, but last night we heard the testimonies. Almost every testimony, not all of them, but just about every one of them, started with childhood and with some connection with parents. Did you notice that? You notice how big of a deal those formative years are? We all go back to that. You young adults and those of you that are parents in here, it is a huge deal that you put those gates and those bars up. 
and you protect those children. I believe that there are boundaries that have to be in place for young people and for children because they don't have their feet up under them yet. They're not spiritually mature enough yet to when they sit down and there's some LGBTQ XYZ beside them. They're not spiritually mature yet to handle that stuff. You need to protect them. You need to equip them so they can mature and grow into that, but you better protect them because the devil's going to try to get them, man. It's amazing to me how some parents will just throw them out to the throw them in the den of lions. Then you get upset when they go into the world. Don't come to me or don't come to these pastors and say, well, you know, the church failed. Maybe if you had a better Sunday school program or, or can't you do something with my young person? No, nah, you should have kept them out of the hell holes and you should have protected them. You should have put up some gates and bars and you should have done your job. I can't do your job for you. Let me take some pressure off of us pastors here for a minute. I think I'm right. Correct me if I'm wrong. The church isn't everything. Amen. Dispensationally, God starts with the family first. Amen. It's Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve and the kids, way before it's even the nation of Israel, and way before it's even the church. We can't do what you can do. And I try to tell our Sunday school teachers this. I say, look, you do the best you can. We are here to supplement what the parents are doing. Yeah, you can teach them some good things and you are here to reinforce what the parents are doing. But if they're not getting the Bible at home, they're not going to learn too much on Sunday morning. Don't put all the responsibility on one hour or 30 minutes a week. And pastors and Sunday school teachers, don't beat yourself up. You're doing the best you can. Parents ought to be doing their job. You know, you have all the little stuff, you know, and you have the little stuff. You send it home with the kid, and they have their little thing they're supposed to read, memorize their verse, and come back. And if they don't come back with that, it's not their fault. It's the parents' fault. Because the parents don't make it a priority to protect their, pro- their uh, progeny, their, um, their heritage, their posterity. Nehemiah's ticked off, man. And it bothers me, and I think it bothers me because I do not have children. I think sometimes I can be a little bit objective. I can back up and I can say, man, look at what works there. And let me say this, those of you that have had prodigals, it's not always just your fault. Because listen to this, if you can always blame yourself for what your kids do, you'd have to blame God for what happened to Adam and Eve. There is personal responsibility with young people. And sometimes parents, man, I know good Bible-believing Christian parents that did everything right, and their kids went in the far country, and some of them didn't come back. You know, you read about the one who came back. There's For every one who comes back, there's 150 that don't make it back. You do everything you can, you pray, you turn them over to God, they have their responsibility. So there's a balance with this deal thing is, you've got to do your job individually. Well, we're about done. It's our job to conserve our place. He says in 29, Remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant. Verse 30, Thus cleansed I them from all strangers and appointed the wards of the priests and the Levites, everyone in his business, and for the wood offerings at times appointed, and for the, the first fruits. Remember me, oh my God, for good. It's kind of like when you read about the last days of Jesus. The only one who did the right thing that day was Jesus. Maybe the women who stood by, but, you know, Herod and Pilate, and you read about the, the six trials Jesus had, and you read about all that. Even the disciples forsook him. Here's Nehemiah. He's setting people back in their place. Nehemiah says, Lord, I did what I could do. But here's the thing. You cannot, and thank God for leaders. I thank God I have some mentors in my life that I will call from time to time and say, hey, what what do you think about this? I need some counsel. 
You need some people beside you that are fighting with you. You need some people behind you that you're pulling along, but you need somebody in front of you to kind of follow behind. And thank God for leaders that He's put in our lives. But what we see with Nehemiah, when Nehemiah was gone, it all fell to pieces. And it shouldn't be that way. You're going to get out there and it's going to be up to you to conserve this place of fellowship. Your pastors aren't going to be there. This camp is going to dismiss. What are you going to do? I want to give you an illustration, a story of a man in our church. And I won't give his name, but years and years ago, he attended our church as a young boy. And got saved in our church and all those things. But he grew up and like a lot of people, he just got away from God. And he didn't conserve that place of fellowship. He just went the way of the world. Went in the military, different things like that. Well, years pass and thank the Lord his son began to come to our church and he got saved and he actually went off to PBI and he's at another place now helping out in the church. And, um, you know, I always had an acquaintance with him because I saw him because of his son, you know, that was in our church. And so I saw him from time to time, him and his wife. But, you know, they didn't come to church. Maybe a special occasions we have homecoming, you know, and people that hadn't been in 20 years show up, you know. Some people only know what the church looks like when it has Easter lilies and Christmas poinsettias in the church. So... But anyway, uh, he would come then, you know, and I knew him, and uh, his mother was a great godly woman. She prayed for me, and I preached her funeral. She was a great godly woman, and uh, well, time goes on there, and lo and behold, if his wife didn't have a massive heart attack and, and die right in front of him, that literally shook his world. You know where he's at right now? He's in church every time the doors are open. He is one of our most faithful church members. And you get to talking to him. He's there all the time. He's praying all the time. And this has been a few years now. He is plugged in. He's closer to God than he's ever been. But you get to talking to him, and those tears will come down. And he'll say, Preacher, I wasted so many years. He's got some health conditions. The Lord's done some great things for him. He's about to, believe it or not, get remarried. And God's brought a Christian lady in our church. And what an amazing testimony to see what God can do. But when you see the hurt and the tears on his face, I'm talking years of broken life, of a broken life. You better conserve what you have. You heard some of these testimonies of these guys that have been in the world. Some of you, you're a little bit young and the bright lights have a little bit of attraction to it. You know, the far country doesn't look so bad. They never show you the other side of the billboard. They never show you that. Believe me, I have seen the other side of the billboard. I've been in homes where death has occurred because of sin. I've seen the other side of the billboard on many occasions. You want to just stay away from it. You want to nurture and conserve that place of fellowship that you have with Jesus Christ. And you need to shut Tobiah out finally and forever. Be resolved. You see Tobiah? You just leave him alone. Don't feel sorry for him. It's kind of like Ishmael, you know. Right. Ishmael wants you to feel sorry for him. You know, Ishmael's older than Isaac. You know, he's the older brother. Ishmael says, you know, I've been here longer than Isaac. Ishmael's a type of the flesh, the old man. Isaac's the new man, okay? You know the comparison? And Ishmael's like, you know, I've been here a lot longer, you know, and I'm the older brother, and, you know, can't you feed me? Can't you feed me? No, I ain't going to feed you. Just starve to death. Yeah. Don't feel sorry for him. Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for... Just the ability and the privilege to be able to preach and to preach these messages. And I pray my brothers and sisters here got some help from it. Lord, I pray you'd help them. Help all of us, Lord, to be serious about our place of fellowship. And God, I pray that 
Maybe there's still someone here that's holding out that hasn't crossed that line and been serious. I pray that even now, before camp's over, they'll make a decision to remove the rubbish, to rebuild, and to revive, and to make that place a preeminent place in their life for Jesus Christ. Please, God, give us the grace. We cannot make it without your help, Lord. We will fall flat on our face. So we pray and we ask, God, that you'd help all of us to stay faithful so we can please you. We ask it in Jesus' name.